But now here's number seven, the seventh key to sowing and reaping. And it goes like this. It's just another way to quote the same law. And it goes like this. If you don't sow, that's just another way to quote the law. If you don't sow, what? You don't reap. You don't even have a chance. So if you looked at your game plan tomorrow, you might come to the quick conclusion. I got to get some sewing going. How true. Get you some sewing going. And remember, you've got plenty of time. You've got all the time there is. Some people spend enough TV time to make a fortune. The latest article on television watching in this country, according to the latest article, the average television is on in this country in every household seven hours a day, called the Big Seven. I asked a guy one time what his TV cost. He said about $450. I said, you forgot to look at the price tag. He said, what do you mean? I knew he was a TV watcher. I said, that television costs you, in my opinion, at least $12,000 a year to watch it, not to own it. Owning it's cheap. Watching it is what's expensive. And I said, hey, $12,000 a year is too much to pay to watch TV. That's too much. Pay a little, but not $12,000. And he's the guy that said, I hope pay TV never comes. Okay, we're trying to cover an awful lot tonight, I realize that, but my time schedule is such that uh, we just have to sort of give it all to you and let you uh, sort the rest out. I wish we had plenty of time for questions and answers and that whole thing, but our time is just limited. But uh, we are trying to go through an awful lot, I realize that. But it uh, looks like everybody's getting it. This is about the note taking this crowd I've seen in a long time. Incredible. Does anybody have five pages yet? Anybody? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Incredible. Okay. Maybe you heard the story about the preacher down in Texas, southern part of the country. Um, he was an evangelist back in the horse and buggy days. And uh, he was very good at being an evangelist. And a lot of people used to come and hear him preach. And one day he put up his tent in one of these Texas towns and expected a big crowd as usual to come here and preach. And he got there first night of the tent revival, walked in. 7.30, time to start. And to his surprise, the tent was empty. He thought, well, something must be drastically wrong. So he waited till quarter to eight, nobody showed up. Eight o'clock, zip. Finally, 8.15. One lone cowboy wandered up on his horse, tied his horse up outside, came in, sat down on the front bench, right, waiting for something to happen. The preacher thought, well, at least I better go down and talk to the cowboy. So he walks down, talks to the cowboy, and he says, cowboy, I'm the preacher. And he said, I don't know what to tell you. Something's gone wrong. He said, this tent was supposed to be full of people. He said, I'm embarrassed. He said, you're the only one that showed up. And he said, I really don't know what to do. And the cowboy said, well, I'm not a preacher, so I really can't tell you what to do. You know, he said, I'm just a cowboy. But he said, I know this. If I went out to feed my cattle and only one showed up, I'd at least feed it. The preacher thought, hey, the cowboy is right. If you've got a good idea to share, you should share it if there's one or a thousand. So he got kind of inspired by this conversation and he jumped up on the platform and started to preach as if the tent was full of people, just exploded. And he went for an hour, hour and 15 minutes, just kept rolling, finally he quit. And when he finished, he came down off the platform, talked to the cowboy again. He says, well, cowboy, what did you think of my sermon? And the cowboy said, uh, well, I'm not a preacher, so I really can't tell. You know, he said, I'm just a cowboy. But he said, I know this, if I went out to feed my cattle and only one showed up, I'd feed it, but I wouldn't dump the whole load on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So anyway, if it seems like we're dumping the whole load tonight, I guess we are. But uh, gosh, everybody's doing well. I'm having a good time. I appreciate the response here tonight. Okay, the next subject is setting goals. Let me show you what turned my life every way but loose. Mr. Schof dropped this idea on me, changed me completely. Setting goals. Here's what can easily happen if you don't set goals. It's easy to let life deteriorate into making a living instead of designing a life. And we all have a choice, make a living or design a life. It's easy to get trapped by economic necessity and settle for existence rather than substance. That's easy. But the best advice I, I can give you on how to break out of that trap is to learn how to set goals. Mr. Shelf put it to me this way. He said, Jim, if you had enough reasons, you could do the most incredible things. I never forgot how he put that. If you have enough reasons. See, reasons will change your whole life. Mr. Shelf said to me, he said, Mr. Rohn, I think you've got plenty of intelligence, you've got plenty of talent, you've got plenty of ability. Probably what you lack is plenty of reasons. He said, I don't think your current bank balance is a true indication of your level of intelligence. I was happy to hear that. He said, I think you're much smarter than your present bank balance indicates. And that turned out to be true. I was much smarter. But of course, my first question was, well, then why isn't it bigger? And he said, you don't have enough reasons. You've got enough intelligence, but not enough reasons. So see, reasons can change your life. Here's what else I found out. Reasons come first, answers come second. You don't get the answers to do well till you get the reasons. Life has a mysterious way of hanging on to all the answers and only gives them up to the people that are inspired by reasons. So reasons make the difference in how your life works out. Now, what are some of the reasons for doing well? Let's go through a quick list called reasons for doing well. First is personal reasons. Some people do well for recognition. Some people do well for respect. Some people do well for the way it makes them feel. They love the feeling of being a winner. Those are good reasons. I have some millionaire friends that keep working 10, 12 hours a day, making more millions. And it's not because they need the money. It's because they need the joy and the satisfaction and the pleasure that comes from being a constant winner. And see, it's not just the money anyway. It's the journey, not the money. Once in a while, somebody says to me, boy, if I had a million dollars, I'd never work another day in my life. That's probably why the good Lord sees to it they don't get their million, right? They'd quit. They'd quit. Okay. Next is family reasons. Some people do extremely well for other people. And that's powerful. Human beings can greatly affect each other. Sometimes we will do things for somebody else we will not do for ourselves. We're made that way. I met a man one time who said, Mr. Rohn, to do all the things I want to do with my family around the world, he said, I got to have at least a quarter of a million dollars a year. I thought, incredible. Could a guy's family affect him that much? And the answer is, of course. How fortunate are the people that find themselves greatly affected by somebody for personal achievement. And we are affected. The writer of a recent song said, if not for you, 
The winter would hold no spring, couldn't hear a robin sing. I just wouldn't have a clue if not for you. So we can be affected. That might be one of the most stimulating reasons to do well, finding somebody. When Andrew Carnegie died, the wee little Scotsman that built the big steel industry, when he died, they opened up his desk. And in one of the desk drawers, they found a slip of paper. On that piece of paper, Mr. Carnegie had written his goal for his life. And he wrote it when he was in his 20s. And on that piece of paper, it said, I'm going to spend the first half of my life accumulating money. I'm going to spend the last half of my life giving it all away. What a goal. He got so inspired by that goal that the first half of his life, he accumulated $450 million. And the last half of his life, he gave it all away. Good question tonight. What's got you turned on? What's got you bombed out of sight to get up early and stay up late and hit it all day? Next question. What's got you turned off? When I found the answers to those two questions, my life exploded into change. I finally found out what had me turned off and I got that cured. And then I got me a long enough list of reasons to turn me on. And once the lights went on for me, age 25, they've never gone out. I've fallen out of the sky a few times, but I've never lost that drive to make something unique out of my life. See, reasons altered my whole life. Now there's another list of reasons called nitty gritty. Hard little reasons. Sometimes those little reasons are the most powerful reasons that can change your life. Sometimes it doesn't take much. I now carry several hundred dollars in my money clip. It's only a few hundred dollars, but it was one of those reasons turned my life around. Just before I met Mr. Shelf, I heard a knock at the door. I go to the door. And there's a little girl standing there about this tall selling Girl Scout cookies. And she gave me one of the finest sales presentations I've ever heard. Special deal, several flavors, this whole package of stuff, $2. And with a big smile, she very politely asked me to buy. And I wanted to. Big problem. I'm broke. I don't have. Two dollars. And to this day, I can remember the pain and the embarrassment. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I've been to college. I'm working. I'm 25. I don't have two dollars. And I didn't want to tell her that for some reason. So I did what I thought was next best. I lied. I said, hey, look, I've already bought lots of Girl Scout cookies. I've still got plenty stacked in the house, which was not true. But it seemed to get me off the hook for the moment. She said, well, gosh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. And she went away. When she left, I closed the door. And that was the day I said to myself, I don't want to live like this anymore. I've had it with lying and I've had it with being broke. I'm never gonna let this happen to me ever again. I promised that day I would work as hard as possible and would always carry plenty. It took me a little while, but now I do. It was one of those reasons. And I guess I carry plenty for two reasons. One is the way it makes me feel, but also in case I bump into another Girl Scout selling cookies. Right? I'm ready. I walked out of the Bank of America one time up in Saratoga, California, where I used to live. Two little girls selling candy right outside the bank. Good place. 
Like some girls organization they're working for, right? I come walking out of the bank. This first little girl walks up to me. She said, Mister, would you like to buy some candy? I said, I probably would. What kind is it? She said, it's Almond Roca. I said, my gosh, that's my favorite. She said, wonderful. I said, how much is it? She said, it's just two dollars. I thought, incredible. I said, how many boxes of that candy have you got? She said, five. And her little friend was standing there. She was selling candy too. I said, how many boxes have you got? She said, I've got four. I said, that's nine. I'll take them all. They said, really? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's my favorite. I've got some friends. I'll pass them around. They got so excited, put all this candy together. I reached in my pocket, gave them the $18. When I've got the candy and they've got the money, that first little girl looked up, looks up at me. She says, Mister, you are really something. How about that? Can you imagine only spending $18 and have somebody look at you in the face and say, you are really something? Now you know why I carry heavy, right? <laughs> I'm not going to miss any more. It was just one of those reasons helped to change my life. One of my nitty gritty reasons was budget finance. Budget finance used to grind my soul. Way back in those early days, I had fallen for one of those consolidation loans where you take all your little hard-to-pay bills, put them into one big impossible-to-pay bill, right? <laughs> I would get four or five payments behind. This one guy used to call me day and night. I don't think they're allowed to do that anymore. Harassed me. Threatened to run me in front of the judge. Threatened to ruin my credit. Threatened to embarrass my family. One day he said, we're going to come get your car, drag it rear end up down the street in front of your neighbors. The guy even called me a flake. And back in those days, I'm broke, I'm pitiful, there's nothing I can do about it. But I never forgot how the guy treated me. And when I met Mr. Show and I got my life started, straightened out and the money started to flow, that was one of my first projects, budget finance. I poured it on day and night. I finally put all the money together I owed him, which was considerable. I picked a day for the payoff. And when the payoff day came, I put the money in small bills in a big briefcase. <laughs> and I walked into the budget finance office on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. The guy who harassed me so often, his desk was about three back. I walked right up to his desk, startled him. He wondered what I was doing there. It was the first time I'd been there since I'd borrowed the money, right? <laughs> Without saying a word, I opened up this briefcase, dumped this pile of money all over his desk. I said, count it. It's all there. I will never be back. And I turned around and stormed out. Now, that might not be noble, but if you haven't tried it, you've got to one time. <laughs> it can be the day that turns your life around. All you need is a reason that turns you on. One of my dear friends, Robert DePew, Bobby used to be a school teacher in Lindsay, olive capital of the world. Bobby taught school several years, got a little weary teaching school. One day decided he wanted to get into sales. So without telling anybody, he just up and quit his job teaching school and jumped into sales. When he did, his brother made fun of him, laughed at him, put him down, said Roberts lost his mind, had a good job teaching school. Now he thinks he's a sales. He's gonna go down the drain, lose everything. Just put him down something fierce. Bobby said, the way my brother acted when I got into sales, he said that made me so mad. 
I decided to get rich. And my question for you tonight is, is it possible to get that man? Of course. Wealth is not a matter of intelligence. It's a matter of inspiration. Today, Robert happens to be one of my millionaire friends. Bobby's rich. Frank Sinatra said one time, the best revenge is massive success. Hey, get you a long enough list of reasons so that after tonight you never lack for inspiration. You might not have all the answers right away, but you can get the answers if you can get the reasons. Now let me give you a little simple formula for goal setting, okay? We take two, two and a half hours on the weekend for the whole 10 year plan. We don't have time for that tonight, but let me get you started with a little simple formula Mr. Schof gave me, and maybe this will be helpful. First of all, I've divided goals into two parts. First is long range. Long range goals, that's your dreams. Your dreams for the next three, five, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, actually the rest of your life. Your dreams. You've got to keep dreaming. Ronald Reagan, president, said to the joint session of Congress a few weeks ago, the republic is a dream. And if we don't keep dreaming, we will lose the republic. Your better future is a dream for yourself and for your family. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to be? What do you want to see? You've got to dream dreams. There's a Bible phrase that says, without dreams and visions, people perish. You've got to have something to go for that inspires the heart and the soul. Dreams. From the children of Sanchez, it says, take the crumbs from starving soldiers, they won't die. Take the bread from hungry children, they won't cry. But without dreams, we all will die. You've got to dream. Don't lose your dreams for yourself, for your future, for your family. The dreams of love and enterprise and travel and doing things, becoming something unique on your journey here. Don't lose your dreams. Do some dreaming. That's long range goals. You've got to have those. So that's number one. Here's the second part of goals, short range. Short range goals, that's your goals for tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, the immediate future. We call these confidence builders. Because if you set up something short range, go for it, get it, latch, latch onto it, work hard, accomplish it. That starts building your strong feelings to go for your dream. Now I've divided goals into three categories. Here they are. Number one is economic. That's your goals for money, income, business, profits, production, economics. Make sure you've got your economics well planned. Economics plays a major role in everybody's life. Economics is major, which means it ought to be meticulously well planned for tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, long range. What if you ask somebody tomorrow if you could see their meticulously well-planned list of economic goals? What would they probably say? They say, you some kind of a nut? You must be weird. Hey, I found out what success is. Success is doing what the failures won't do. Make sure you've got your economics well-planned. It'll put you in the top 5%. One of the key little subjects we talk about on the weekend is the seven fundamentals for wealth and happiness. And that's one of them, well-planned economics. It's a fundamental if you want to do well. Join the top 5%. Anybody in this room can join the top 5%, if you will. Okay. Now here's the second category of goals, things. Make a list of the things you want. 
And on my list of things, now I put everything. Little things as well as major things. Doesn't matter how small it is, it goes on my list. I used to just put major things, cars, homes. I don't do that anymore. I now load my list with everything, everything. And the reason is part of the fun of having a list is checking it off. That's it. Boy, at the end of the day, if you can go, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, whatever it is, right? You get into the habit. So load up your list, the things you want. Now, when you check off something major, celebrate. That's an important point to make. Celebrate your achievements. Live it up, have a party. When you reach something you've worked for for a while. See, we all grow from two experiences. One is called the pain of losing. The other one is called the joy of winning. We need both of them. Amplify them as much as you can, which also means make losing painful. If you set up something, fooled around, didn't get it, put it on yourself. On the other side, if you did get it, congratulate yourself. Self-congratulations is a sign of maturity. Seeking congratulations is a sign of immaturity. But hey, winning and losing, see, that's what it's all about. That's the name of the game. Now, some people lead such mediocre lives. At the end of the day, they don't know whether they're winning or losing. They got no clue. Guy's just going through the day with his fingers crossed. There's a better way. Okay, here's the third category of goals, personal development. Put those goals together, personal development goals. That's your goals to be stronger, more decisive, be a speaker, be a leader, learn a language, all kinds of skills. The whole weekend seminar was designed to improve all of your skills so that you walk away more skillful. And that's what you want, the personal development skills. That's what attracts, that's what brings good things to your life, the person you become more skillful. Now, this is quite a package to work on. Economics, things, personal development. For tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, long range. Okay, that'll get you started.